Well, we're actually going to begin. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center, and we're very pleased that you're here for the Bay Area Latin Americanist Forum. As many of you know, this is a regular series that the center organizes every semester, and we try to bring together a range of people on the Berkeley campus and elsewhere in the Bay Area to talk about a range of issues. Today we're very pleased uh, to have Paul Steinberg with us to talk about a critical set of environmental issues in the context of developing uh, countries in the context of unstable societies. Uh, Paul Steinberg received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz. He currently is an associate professor of political science and environmental policy. Uh, at Harvey Mudd College, one of the Claremont Colleges uh, in Southern California. He's a visiting scholar uh, this year in the Environmental Science Policy Management Program, ESPM, here at Berkeley. Uh, and he's coming out with a new book on comparative environmental politics, uh, which he's jointly uh, co-edited with Stacy Van Dever, uh, that will be published this year by MIT Press. And his previous book, Environmental Leadership in Developing Countries, was also published uh, by MIT and came out in 2001. So we will talk, and then after that, we will have uh, a broad discussion on the issues he raises in this area. Paul. Thank you, Harley. Thanks to all of you for coming. Good to see everybody. Um, I'd like to spend the next hour considering a very difficult question. And that question is, how can we achieve sustainability in a context in which political systems are themselves not sustainable? That is to say, they're subject to all manner of institutional turnover and social upheaval. And my interest in this question can be pinpointed with unusual accuracy to December of 1990, Cameraman, I'll warn you in advance, I do wander, so my apologies. Um, it's a Bluetooth era. Um, December of 1990, I was hired by the Natural Resources Defense Council, a prominent environmental law group in, in DC, excuse me, in uh, San Francisco and elsewhere, as a lowly intern asked to produce a report on species conservation in the Soviet Union. So NRDC was preparing for its first uh, trip of its lawyers and uh, scientists to the USSR and I was asked to gather all information that I could on conservation policy. Um, now mind you this was a this was a very interesting research project because the Cold War uh, was still underway. There was very little contact between Soviet scientists, citizens and the outside world. There was no internet um, and so I was poring over old CIA spy maps right of the Russian Far East trying to figure out where this stuff was and looking at uh, read data books of endangered species, the likes of uh, which had never been seen in the Western world, deer with long fangs and all sorts of bizarre things, right? And so it was a great research experience, but as I was finishing up my project, something very uh, inconvenient happened from a research standpoint, namely the Soviet Union ceased to exist as a political entity. So I could be found on a cold December night in a high-rise building in San Francisco using my computer search and replace function to put Commonwealth of Independent States in place of Soviet Union, which is what I was advised by their attorneys after all, uh, the best thing to do at this late stage of the report. And mind you, this was less than a year after I had been evacuated from Liberia, West Africa, as a Peace Corps volunteer, where my wife and I were riding in a taxi on a remote jungle road and our taxi was hijacked by heavily armed soldiers who were also drunk on palm wine um, and then whisked away with the rest of the American expatriate community at five in the morning with a marine escort uh, from that country. So sitting in my cubicle several months later staring at my report on conservation policy in this thing that used to be called the Soviet Union I was struck by a certain irony. That is on the one hand if we're to do a decent job of caring for the earth we need institutions and social practices capable of sustaining resources over time horizons of centuries, right? And on the other hand, 
social change, both for better and for worse, is one of the defining characteristics of human organization. And this is an issue that has continually resur uh, resurfaced in the course of my research over the intervening 20 years. Much of what I do for a living is to interview uh, very high-ranking officials uh, and reformers in developing countries, asking them politically sensitive questions about how to bring about reform in state institutions. And it's become very clear to me that political and economic upheaval and associated institutional turnover are the bane of efforts at sustainability in much of the world, particularly in developing and post-communist countries. In Ecuador, Mm. Oh, this is not working at all. I think we need to get into presentation mode of some sort. So it advances here, but not there. Yes. How about if it's done by hand? So we want to be here. I am going to proceed without visuals because they're not that important until slide four. So you've got about three minutes. Um, in Ecuador, Environment Minister Yolanda Cacabadze was doing an outstanding job in the mid-1990s of advancing sustainability in that country. She attracted a lot of money from abroad, was reforming state institutions, bringing together stakeholders, until that is her government was tossed out by a coup. In Guatemala, it's been exceptionally difficult to put in place policies for forest conservation, particularly to take advantage of all the money that's now available for climate change mitigation, planting trees to pull carbon out of the air. And so the money instead has been flowing to uh, Costa Rica, um, which has a more stable institutional uh, environment. In Bolivia, a country with very pressing environmental problems, Bolivians innovated the world's first environmental trust fund, a very important innovation that was subsequently emulated throughout the developing world and post-communist countries. The idea being to have a stable source of funding, since Bolivians are no strangers to political instability. Bolivia at one point was actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most changes of government in a 150 year period. Bolivians are no strangers to instability, and so they created this mechanism that would smooth out funding they managed to attract $100 million for this. And following a change in government, it was cut into pieces and dispersed and collapsed. Okay. In, uh, now, all of this has some serious consequences for efforts to improve social and environmental outcomes. But it also carries significant implications for social science research on governance and institutional reform. How's it looking? I can do this by hand, certainly. Or is it just toast? Okay, we're certainly now at the part where I could use visual, so maybe a, a reboot and I'll just keep moving forward. Um, all right, so it carries some important implications for social science research, in particular for theories of policy change. Policy change is the shorthand term that policy-oriented researchers use to describe efforts to change what governments do and the kinds of problems that they focus on, whether it's purely security and quelling unrest are actually trying to advance the public good and how they approach those sorts of things. But when we look more closely at the word change and what that means in the context of state institutions, we can see that change simultaneously refers to two very separate things. The first is what I would call shifting, moving away from some sort of institutional arrangement that was deemed unsatisfactory by reformers. Okay, and so in the context of environmental protection, this usually involves creating new environmental agencies, getting a national park system up and running, pollution monitoring stations and so forth to try and change away from old practices uh, and do a better job of providing public goods like drinking water uh, and so forth. The second element of change, however, is that the new institutional arrangement has to last. Endurance. Endurance is central to the very meaning of institutions described in the 20s by sociologist Everett Hughes as, quote, relative permanence of a distinctly uh, social sort. For collective action theorists, 
Institutional rules create the order and predictability necessary for coordinated social behavior. So as March and Olson put it, to quote, an institution is a relatively enduring collection, my emphasis, of rules and organized practices embedded in structures of meaning and resources that are relatively invariant in the face of turnover of individuals and relatively resilient to the idiosyncratic preferences and expectations of individuals in changing external circumstances. In other words, they're supposed to last. So the proper metaphor for policy change is not one of continual reversals in course, it's one of switching tracks, right? And so switching and sticking suggests two very different sets of causal mechanisms that are together a necessary condition for significant shifts in what governments do. And today I'd like to focus on the second part of this challenge, namely making reforms stick. So, I'll keep going. And you'll just take my word for it that the photos were beautiful. Um, photo of social upheaval in Kenya. So despite the pervasiveness of social upheaval in developing and post-communist countries, its impact on efforts to move, uh, and its impact on efforts to move society in a different direction, this stuff has not been studied. This has not been studied in a, in a systematic fashion. And that's kind of peculiar if you think about it, because these are very in-your-face events, right? We're not talking about trying to discern the subtleties of social capital, how do we measure it, how do we, you know, we're not talking about village reciprocity and spending months in the field to try and understand what it is that villagers do in the political, no, no, we're talking about major events that have very blatant consequences for the provision of public goods, like protecting the environment. So why hasn't this been studied? Thank you, sir. Guatemala forestry, Bolivia problems, boom, boom, boom. Why hasn't this been studied? For one, the short time horizons of NGOs and other uh, actors who are at the forefront of global conservation efforts. These are project-driven organizations. Okay, you go to work for one of these organizations, typically what you're doing is you're a project manager. And a project, by definition, I know having had to sit through uh, seminars on project management is a short-term undertaking. Okay, typically three to five, maybe seven years would be a long-term project, right? So these groups are not thinking about long-term social processes. And I say this as someone who works very closely with a number of these organizations. And frankly, they and their counterparts throughout the world are so busy dealing with the latest crisis, the latest um, uh, effort by some senator to hunt in a national park or to try and put uh, uh, gasoline in the Land Rover to get something done. They're so focused on the latest crisis that they devote relatively little attention to long-term social processes. But how about social scientists, right? How about those of us who are afforded the luxury of thinking about longer-term processes? And when you think about the contribution of academic research to trying to make the world a better place, um, to my mind, a lot of it, at least within uh, social inquiry, hinges on this. It's luxury to stand back, ask inconvenient questions, and study long-term processes. Um, well, the diagnosis that I've reached for why this has not been studied um, is the following. First of all, policy research focuses almost entirely on industrialized countries. Okay, The policy sciences um, are tied largely to the United States, which is almost without parallel in the world in its political stability. Okay, that's our defining characteristic, is not that we're a democracy, but that we are long-lasting. Uh, one of uh, six countries in the world with a constitution over 100 years old. Um, but it's also true that comparative social science has largely ignored policy issues. And many of the most pressing social issues um, that are out there have not been a focus, at least within the area that I operate in, of comparative politics. And so just to back this up, let me show you a bit of data. Um, this is a, uh, an analysis um, that I did of uh, two of the major journals in comparative politics, uh, comparative politics and comparative political studies, to look from the period 1990 to 2008. In other words, the environment was being taken seriously by a wide range of countries uh, already. So if it were to show up, it should show up during this time period. And of 188 articles, in this journal and 344 there, the environment appears once and four times, human rights zero, four times, social policy a little bit. In fact, the only policy issue to receive sustained and serious attention is economic policy and growth. 
Okay, so somehow these things like, oh, saving our oceans are viewed as too parochial, too small to actually warrant concerns by the great thinkers of our time. Okay, and the focus on the economy, I mean, I, I have a couple of working hypotheses. I think that it corresponds well to certain intellectual traditions, including post-Marxist studies, as well as rational choice theory, right? So if you have a uh, an economic methodology, economic subject matters might lend themselves better to that. Okay, and so, so what are they focusing on? focusing on? These articles are focusing on macro level change. Under what conditions do you get authoritarian versus uh, democratic regimes and so forth? Actual policy concerns, too parochial. Okay, finally, why is this stuff not being studied? I would say it has something to do with the darker connotations of stability studies. Stability has earned a bad name. Research on institutional stability gained an unfortunate reputation in an earlier generation of comparative politics research, as it often focused on the durability of regimes irrespective of their commitment to human rights. So Samuel Huntington, for example, considered the PRI in Mexico to be a model worthy of emulation. And here's a photo of that regime ordering tanks into Mexico City to crush student protests in 1968. A good recent critique of stability studies can be found in this piece by Cedric Jourd. And stability has been tainted by other associations outside of academia, right? So authoritarian regimes in Chile and elsewhere invoke stability as a, as a rationale for their rule, while global powers have often used the rhetoric of stability as a rationale for supporting dictators to their liking. But I would like to paint a different picture of stability. So on the left, we have one type of collective action that relies on stable social institutions. And on the right, we have another depicting a microloan program in East Africa. That is to say, stability may be the currency of dictators, but it's also a prerequisite for community development, wealth accumulation, sustainability, and other social goal, essential social goals that can't be advanced in social settings characterized by a constant churning of institutions. Finally, is environmental protection really an essential goal? for ordinary citizens in Latin America and throughout the global south? Or is the environment simply a concern for the well-to-do, a luxury good that people can uh, turn to after meeting their basic material needs of physical security and food and so forth? Well, it turns out that the notion that people in poorer countries care less about the environment than their counterparts in the industrialized north is a complete and total unfounded myth. The public opinion data consistently demonstrate equal levels of environmental concern across North and South. A recent review is provided in this piece by Dunlap and York. And they show equal levels of concern across income levels in both rich and poor countries consistently. Okay. Moreover, the myth of environmental privilege, as I call it, is exploded by the reality of environmental movements in different parts of the world. Whether it's Argentina or South Korea or Kenya, some of you may have seen this photo in the New York Times of the Maldives. Uh, they had an underwater meeting of ministers in an effort to draw global attention to climate change and rising sea levels, right? Um, these are concerns that are taken seriously uh, around the world. So, let's begin by putting a finer point on the problem, beginning with the unassuming green sea turtle, Colonia Midas. It takes 50 years for this sea turtle to reach sexual maturity. Okay, so let's consider what's been going on in the world from the time that this turtle was a little hatchling on the beach until the day when it was ready to, shall we say, start thinking about future generations. Between 1960 and 19, 2000, excuse me, 1960 and 2003, there were over 200 successful military coups around the world. From 1946 to 2003, there were 229 armed conflicts, mostly internal, in 148 countries. And from 1970 to 2006, 39 countries experienced triple-digit annual inflation and consumer prices for more than one year. Now, these are the sorts of changes that you might expect would affect things like whether sensitive beach habitat has protected status, whether local communities have the support they need to develop tourist-based conservation strategies, and whether fishermen respect the law. Okay. Between 1951 and 1990, the average lifespan of a democracy was 18 years 
for countries with per capita income between $1,000 and $3,000. This matches the average lifespan of a pelican. And here a contemplative bird is thinking about what the future holds in store. During this same time period, the average lifespan of democracy in the poorest countries with per capita income of less than $1,000 was six years, about half the lifespan of a frog. Okay. Within the past 75 years, roughly the lifespan of a macaw, there have been changes in constitutions in all of Latin America, all of Africa, all of Asia, all of the Middle East, and almost all of Europe. Okay. So social change is clearly endemic to modern society. Um, and of course, it's a necessary condition for human betterment. But in many countries, political turnover has reached epidemic proportions. The data in this figure are uh, confirm the widely appreciated point that political instability is spread unevenly throughout the world. Here I took data from the cross-national time series uh, database and just put it into a GIS format. This shows only the most extreme type of political change, the adoption of a new national constitution. And some, uh, I've been told by a Middle Eastern scholar, sometimes new constitutions are adopted for purely ceremonial purposes, but these are broadly representative of major shifts in political representation, civil military relations, legal process, the distribution of power between the center and the, and the outlying regions, and patterns of participation by ethnic, religious, and other social sectors. So the point from an environmental policy standpoint is why should a factory owner take seriously regulations issued by a government agency unlikely to last through the next election or coup, right? And of course, political change is only one type of instability. Here are the data I referred to a moment ago on hyperinflation. So these are countries that have experienced triple-digit inflation in consumer prices um, for more than three years during the period of 1970 to present. What does agricultural sustainability look like when commodity prices are rising at an average annual rate of 500%? Right? What does the future look like? And these, these create very, uh, a social environment in which collective action is very difficult to pursue. Guillermo O'Donnell put it this way. He said, anyone who has lived under these circumstances understands this is a harsh, nasty world. The longer and deeper the crisis is, and the less confidence there is that the government will be able to solve it, the more rational it becomes for everyone to act, one, at highly disaggregated levels, especially in relation to state agencies, two, with extremely short time horizons, and three, with assumptions that everyone else will do the same. A gigantic national level prisoner's dilemma holds. And there's significant anecdotal evidence to suggest that these sources of instability can have negative impacts on environmental institutions. In the Philippines, Michael Ross, in his book Timber Booms, documents how in the years following the Second World War, this country had an exemplary forestry agency with, quote, a well-trained staff, considerable political independence, a policy of promoting sustained yield forestry, and a reputation for avoiding the corruption and patronage that plagued many other government agencies. But in the mid-1950s, fluctuation in timber exports destroyed the agency, making it a target of political leaders seeking access to surging revenues. In Bulgaria, in the wake of the transition from Soviet rule, Baker and Baumgartel report that instability at the apex of government, in particular at the ministerial level, uh, make it difficult to ensure policy continuity. In Argentina, an analysis of forestry and pollution initiatives concludes that, quote, feckless and unstable state agencies have created an institutional environment unfavorable even for private initiatives aimed at bypassing government interference. In Brazil, Hochstetler and Keck find that, quote, as new chief executives seek to put their stamp on government, they move environmental agencies from one jurisdiction to another, change their attributions, create new departments, and eliminate others. When frequent reshuffling occurs, it becomes almost as surprising when there's policy continuity as when there's not. Nepal. Heinen and Shrethra report in 2006 that the political upheaval of the past decade has brought conservation policy reforms to a standstill. Foreign tourism is notoriously susceptible to this sort of upheaval, and in Eastern Africa, events such as the 1998 embassy bombings and widespread civil unrest, unrest in Kenya in 2007 caused the collapse of tourist-based conservation projects throughout the region. Okay, so clearly something's going on here. 
And these realities not only require that we rethink practical strategies for bringing about social change, they also suggest we may need to re-examine some of the basic assumptions of social science research, particularly theories of policy change that I alluded to earlier. As I noted, this literature is based almost entirely on the experience of the United States. And in reviewing the literature on policy change, William Lowry finds, quote, most dominant causal explanations of significant policy change over time involve unplanned factors arising from the larger political system. Meaning, according to this literature, these large social shifts are often the positive driving force. These are the openings that allow for creative major changes in policy. This is true for each of the three seminal works on policy change in the policy sciences. These authors all find that major reforms are typically associated with changes in social conditions like the growth in the influence of NGOs, the energy crisis of the 1970s, the election of Reagan and his anti-regulatory agenda, shifts in governing coalitions, changes in organization of legislative bodies, new federal power sharing arrangements. These, this sort of institutional and stability in the context of a very stable political system, these are the creative drivers for major change. And certainly we see evidence of this in Latin American countries. Here's a picture of Santa Rosa Hacienda in Costa Rica during the crisis of the Sandinista uprising when this dictator in neighboring Nicaragua was uh, loathed by Costa Ricans. The Costa Rican park officials were very smart. They used this crisis to create the first national park in that country by finding a place that would invoke feelings of nationalism. They expropriated lands that were owned by Somoza, the same lands where William Walker invaded a century earlier, right? And created Costa Rica's first national park in the midst of the crisis of instability in Central America. And they were so they were exploiting this crisis, drawing on long-standing nationalist sentiment, and brought about change, um, taking the first step toward what is today one of, the most, uh, one of the best examples of a national park system anywhere in the world. In Bolivia, when Amazonian indigenous people first mobilized in the early 1990s, and this was unheard of, okay, Evo Morales does not work with these folks, okay? It's a highland movement versus the lowland Amazonian uh, indigenous groups who were not politically active uh, prior, and they mobilized concern about deforestation in their lands and being excluded from these processes. When this happened, it caught the Bolivian political establishment by surprise. They marched from the lowlands, from the Amazon, all the way um, you know, up to 16,000 plus feet up into the Andes. The national press was covering their every move every day. What happened? Indigenous leaders and Bolivian environmentalists took advantage of this opportunity, came together in the midst of this crisis, and uh, passed new policies that would grant greater autonomy to indigenous peoples to control protected areas. A prominent example is Gran Chaco National Park in eastern Bolivia, the world's largest dry protected um, tropical forest that is managed um, by the Isoseño Guarani in that part of the country. And finally in Brazil, um, a book I referred to earlier by Hochstetler and Keck, in Brazil, a very disorganized collection of environmental groups that didn't have a lot of influence during the transition to democracy came together, they were animated, and they wrote the environmental provision of the new national constitution in the mid-80s. So large-scale changes in national conditions do indeed provide important opportunities for creative efforts at greening the state. But what about when there's too much change, right? Keeping in mind this earlier distinction between switching and sticking, in social settings where there's all this pervasive crisis and perennial shifts in political power, we would expect to find a lot of opportunities to initiate new policy reforms, but that these might not last beyond the next large-scale social disruption. That is, the very factors that in moderation promote policy change in stable industrialized democracies might inhibit it in ex when present in excess in other countries. After all, these sort of exogenous shocks provide opportunities to opponents of environmental regulation, right? When there's instability, it's a chance, or a change in government, it's a chance for a forestry firm to try and come in and extract some timber from a newly harvested, uh, from a new, newly protected, rather, um, part, of the, part of the world. And even 
without major reversals in policy, when there's a lot going on, all sorts of social upheaval, hyperinflation, it's easy for new initiatives to just kind of fade to the background in importance and not enjoy the sort of sustained um, support that they need. So what can be done about it? Um, the final portion of my comments is to um, share some thoughts about mechanisms of institutional reproduction. That is to say, when the durability of institutions can't be taken for granted, we encounter a very interesting and important question for policy change. Namely, what are the mechanisms then that help things to, to stick, to last? What are the mechanisms that can account for institutional resilience in conditions of social instability? Certainly we know from research on path dependence that, to quote Paul Pearson, established institutions generate powerful inducements that reinforce their own stability and further development. In concrete terms, to the extent that environmental policies become embedded in organizational routines and provide benefits that are valued by politically uh, vocal members of society, it becomes difficult to overturn them. And, in practice, policy reformers in, de in these sorts of societies are acutely aware of the tenuous nature of their influence, and so they can be found strategically attaching tethers to their favorite institutional innovation to try and make it last over the long term. Often, the, it's sort of like um, the owners of boats do in anticipation of an approaching storm, right? They, they tether down their, their boats, to dock, and often the storm makes a complete mockery of these attempts, right? Smashing things on the shore. But you can find this in a lot of these countries, and I'd like to talk about some of these, what we would, in social science theory, call mechanisms of reproduction, referring here to work by um, Charles Tilley and, and uh, Kathleen Thalen and others. One of these is good old-fashioned bureaucracies, right? The concept of a modern bureaucracy is very closely tied to the idea of stability. As defined by Max Weber, a bureaucracy is the distinct organizational form oriented toward the provision of long-term public goods. So to the extent that environmental agencies and other institutions approximate this Weberian ideal of professionalism and insulation from the whims of patronage politics, they can offer a measure of continuity across these changes. As Peter Evans has documented, a number of East Asian countries benefit from highly professional bureaucracies that serve as a buffer against the effects of turnover and crises. And in these settings, places like Hong Kong, the challenge is not one of instability. The challenge is to try and crack open these, these very um, competent, professional, distant bureaucracies to have greater public participation and get them to think about something other than just, you know, filling in land uh, and, and growing the economy as quickly as possible. Uh, but in most developing and post-communist countries, bureaucracies provide at best a very thin thread. Uh, as Merrily Grindle reports, quote, where patronage defines who is appointed to office, organizations are susceptible to rapid turnover of staff, and their leaders are highly vulnerable to political changes. Sloan reports that personalistic rule and patronage-based appointments in Latin American bureaucracies result in high levels of turnover and job security, compromising their effectiveness. Meyer Saling reports that, quote, the prevailing patterns in post-communist countries is still one of the top echelons of the civil service changing with each election, or in worse, with government reshuffles. So, what can be done? One approach is the quasi-state agency. Many of you are probably familiar with these. They've grown in uh, numbers in developing and post-communist countries in recent decades, partly in, concern to res to, in response to concerns about corruption and patronage. They're, they have a government-sanctioned function, but they enjoy a certain degree of autonomy in deciding who they hire and how to, manage their, uh, how to manage their budget and so forth. But autonomy comes at a cost, okay? Autonomy comes at a cost. There are issues of public accountability that need to be taken very seriously, but I'd like to point to a different angle, namely, if your agency has a transformative mission, which environmental agencies always do, right? They're supposed to shake things up, supposed to change the behavior of millions of people, including those powerful ones who are running government agencies. If you have a transformative mission, you don't want autonomy from politicians, right? You're gonna be, you're gonna be knocking on the door of the planning ministry, telling them to do things differently. Right? You're telling the Minister of Foreign Affairs, would you please assign your top diplomats to these climate change negotiations rather than this flunky from the, from the local law school um, because this is a really serious issue. Or you're taking on a corrupt forestry agency. Right? You need high level political support. And in fact, Costa Rica went through this debate in the 1980s. Oscar Arias, the current president, was a young reformer at the time and was a participant in this debate. And he said, our new environmental agency should be 
Yes, this is prior to the time when he was actually the environment minister. He said, our environmental agency should be autonomous. It should be a quasi-state institution, okay? It shouldn't be an actual agency. And the more seasoned members of that debate prevailed. They said, no, it has to be an agency part of the cabinet so that we can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other ministries. And fortunately, that's the route they went. Bolivia has created an interesting institutional approach, a forest, uh, what's called superintendency, that, um, for which the forest superintendent is appointed by a joint decision from the legislature and the president. And the term is a six-year term that staggers across uh, political administrations to try and avoid too much political manipulation. Okay. Thus far, I've been talking about state approaches to achieving stability, but of course, state reform takes place in a broader social context, right? It's not just what's going on um, within government agencies. And so another major mechanism of institutional reproduction is the creation of what I would call a policy culture. That is, relatively enduring sets of social expectations regarding government action in a particular issue area. Here are some data from Costa Rica and Bolivia. Um, these trace environmental news events in these two countries over a 35-year time horizon. These are looking at the major daily newspapers in the two countries. And all of these news events have an environmentalist perspective. That is, in the judgment of the 16 content analysis coders who did this, um, they convey, they either contain certain unambiguously environmentalist keywords or convey the sentiment that our environment is important and should be protected. Okay? And there's been a significant rise over time in interest in the environment in these countries, so that even in the midst of major upheaval, the arrival of Evo Morales, right, and everything that he's done for better and for worse in Bolivia, he comes out swinging saying, I'm an environmentalist, indigenous peoples have been environmentalists for thousands of years, here's how we articulate the problem, right, because there is an enduring expectation for state action in this area. And there was spillover from that earlier time in Bolivia in the 1990s of pairing environment and indigenous concerns. So in Costa Rica, in the early days, ah, oh, president, if he or she wants to support the national park system, eh, yeah, it'd be a nice thing to do, a oh, little pajaritos, right? You know, it's, it's a cute thing to do. Today, for a Costa Rican president to try and destroy the national park system, unthinkable. Absolutely unthinkable. Path dependency, right? Okay. Non-state actors, more broadly, serve as a mechanism of reproduction. And in the interest of time, I, I, I'm going to try and I'm going to skim a couple of these points because I want to I want to save a lot of time for discussion. Um, but of course, environmental policy depends heavily on non-state actors, university scientists, investigative journalists, public interest law firms, grassroots advocacy groups, and they can serve as an important source of continuity. For one, they're providing long-term advocacy, right? So they're around for a long time advocating a similar set of ideas to different administrations over time. Second, they provide a home for reformers. So policy change takes place over decades. You need people who can be involved for the long haul. Where does that person go when his or her administration gets kicked out of power? If there's a vibrant civil society sector in this area, it provides an opportunity for them to continue this process of thinking about where can we take the country. And economic constituencies provide an important source of continuity. And this is something that uh, people haven't paid enough attention to. <clears throat> Typically, we think about economic incentives for the environment, meaning how can you convince that farmer to instead of cutting down that tree, um, to leave it standing? We think of economic uh, actors in terms of their economic activities, but these are also political actors. And so if there's a program that's working well, that's providing meaningful income, as is now the case in Costa Rica, to farmers to leave trees standing on their property, and a new administration comes in and tries to trash that program, you have a mechanism of continuity that's going to fight, that's going to voice um, for, uh, to keep it in place. Another mechanism, multi-party alliances. Meaningful connections among environmentalists in different political parties can help to ensure the longevity of these initiatives. Linkages outside the policy subsystem. Okay, and these can be of two sorts. One is horizontal. So horizontally, things are more durable to the extent that the normative goals and regulatory routines of new policies are mainstreamed. Instead of staying inside this little environment agency with its half dozen employees looking nervously to the next crisis or coup, right? When it becomes part of the activities of a broad number of agencies across government, um, then it's more likely that these initiatives will last. <clears throat> 
Vertical linkages, finally, include sharing regulatory power with local organizations. According to Jesse Rebeau, no less than 60 developing countries have decentralized important features of natural resource policy making in recent years. And when a town or regional government has a vested interest in the long-term viability of a protected area for watershed protection or local tourism, its leaders can be expected to push for protection despite shifts in national leadership. In fact, Hart and colleagues report that in the course of Rwanda's devastating civil war in the early 1990s, local community support for guerrilla conservation resulted in considerably less poaching than would have been expected given the suspension of functioning, functioning central government institutions. In contrast, Turiya Habwe and Banana report in 2008 that in Uganda, where local communities did not have a stake in conservation, when that country fell apart in the 1970s, um, local, local communities did nothing. They did nothing to prevent those forests from being wiped out. They didn't have a stake in it. So these kinds of vertical linkages, again, can help to ensure continuity. And vertical linkages upward to international organizations, treaty commitments, international NGOs that are not subject to the same kinds of instability that domestic players are, again, provides a mechanism of continuity. So in all of this, what you really want to do is you want to spread your bets. Okay, you want to spread your bets across these different kinds of constituencies so that insta because instability is unlikely to affect all of them in tandem. And let me give you a concrete example of this. I referred to Bolivia's environmental trust fund, that one that, that got chopped to pieces in the mid 1990s. Well, I was told by the creator of that fund that they did a really good job of building international constituencies, right? $100 million, right? You know, they had Price Waterhouse, and, you know, they, they had the whole thing down. The international community loved them, the Dutch embassy, everybody. But they didn't do a good job of building local constituencies. And his opinion was that they should have done more on that front. And perhaps when there was a change of government, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been trashed. So really, you want constituencies in these different areas. All right, to wrap up very briefly, Lessons for reformers and activists, think long term. Okay, projects can actually be designed to have spillover effects of the sorts that I'm describing here, promoting multi-party approaches, horizontal and vertical linkages, and so forth. Uh, to do so will probably require a cultural change on the part of environmental NGOs and foundations. Um, there's a need to move beyond a short-term project focus something, an argument that might sound familiar to those of you who have been following the development literature for many years. Um, and I think the problem is compounded by trends in the donor world that demand short-term measurable results. Anybody who's been involved with grant making is very aware that they don't want to hear that this is going to make a major difference in the long term. They'd like to know that it's going to make some difference in the short term. right? But I think it's a fight worth having. Finally, implications for theory. There needs to be a sort of rapprochement be between comparative social science and policy theory. In concrete terms, we need more of a comparative perspective within the policy sciences that are based on the experience of stable industrialized democracies and bear very little resemblance to what's actually going on in most of the world. Uh, and finally, we need more of a policy perspective in comparative social science and comparative politics in particular. People's lives really do depend uh, on institutions doing the right thing. And for those of us who think about our professional responsibilities as academics, as not just studying society, but contributing to it, this issue of policy reform and its political and institutional dimensions is just crying out for more research. So with that, I'd be happy to hear any and all comments and questions. Let me turn up the lights. <coughs> Yes? So you've talked about a lot of different mechanisms or ways to get institutions to stick around. Which, which one of these that you've talked about have been more common to Latin America compared with other regions? And which ones have been more clearly about the environment um, as opposed to just all issues in general? Wow. Let me start with your first very difficult to answer question, and then I'll decide whether I'm dodging your second very difficult to answer question. Um, I think the dynamic looks, to the extent that it looks different in Latin America, it, it might be the following. Um, conservation as an idea arose in the 1800s after Latin America was independent and while Africa and the Middle East and Asia were still largely under colonial rule and therefore conservation 
outside of Latin America often is associated with this idea of exclusion and of sort of the foreigner's agenda, right? And so in terms of regional differences, I would say that I and, and my colleagues studying conservation and policy in Latin America don't find, the, the research findings have a different feel to them than a lot of what comes out of the political ecology research based largely in Africa and Asia where national parks are about excluding local communities and so forth. I'm personally not even convinced that that's the, the fuller story in those other parts of the world. I think this is a matter that needs a lot more research and that um, political ecology scholars are often cherry picking uh, cases of the highest conflict. But so in terms of regional differences, I'm not, I realize I'm not answering it with respect to mechanisms of durability per se, but rather a broader conservation context. Um, certainly there are regional differences, as I alluded to, with respect to traditions of civil service, right? Where some Asian countries have a very strong civil service tradition. In Latin America, it's much more pa you know, patronage based. Even in places that have large bureaucracies, um, like Brazil, you know, its environmental agency has tens of thousands of employees. Um, so that's one difference. And the second one was differences in uh, which of those institutional mechanisms have you seen? Oh, regarding the environment versus other areas? Well, I haven't studied those other areas as systematically, so it's a little hard to say. I think one of the differences for environmental management is the role of foreign resources. And so um, I think for many aspects of uh, domestic public goods in developing and post-communist countries, those areas that don't manage to attract international interest would not have the benefit of that kind of vertical linkage to help ensure continuity over time. So if a government you know, tries to wipe out an agency and move to the next thing, the World Bank or Conservation International or the European Union is going to come in and say, well, you know, before you do that, let me describe to you how much money your country's been making off of this initiative. And this isn't a foreign thing. This is, you know, sustainable. Da, da, da. There's, there's a mechanism of continuity there. Whereas if it's an issue that they don't care about or aren't paying attention to, then you don't have that. So there, I had, didn't have to completely touch it. Yeah. I want to thank you for the diversity of examples in your, you know, your sort of graphic knowledge. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the relationship between the Asian and the Latin American countries. Because it seems to me that the Asian countries have a lot of resources that are not being used for is my answer. Um, uh, that's a fascinating example and of course mainstreaming within the armed services constituency that is not just the environment minister. And I'll give you an example. In the Philippines, um, I interviewed the, uh, uh, the number two in the environment ministry there, and he was describing his efforts to mainstream environmental concerns uh, surrounding global warming. Because there's a big debate there. In the Philippines, on the one hand, a lot of Filipino expatriates work in Middle Eastern countries. Therefore, they want to stand behind Middle Eastern countries that don't care at all about climate change, just want to keep burning oil. On the other hand, this is you know, an archipelago nation, right, and, and rising sea levels are very much going to affect it. Um, and so in order to, to try and bring on allies, this one um, environmental official invited his counterpart in the energy ministry to come with him 
to meetings of international donors and told them, feel free to raise money for climate change stuff without going through my environment ministry. You know, to, just, to try and find a way to involve these other actors. Um, and so it's a great example, one that has not, to my knowledge, been studied. Um, within Chile in particular, I would highly recommend the work of, um, this person named David Carruthers, um, work on, on Chile in, uh, you must have the reference, yeah. The, a really good study, post-authoritarian. So David Carruthers, um, you know, a Google Scholar in Chile, would, would find the, the reference, and he does a nice job. I think he's looking at air pollution in particular and sort of struggling with these competing legacies. Um, Chile is also in the process of flooding the lower third of its country uh, for hydropower and NRDC is yes. very interesting. And the RDC. Yeah. 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 So I was wondering, I mean, this framework seems to make really good sense for like kind of domestic issues of conservation, like keeping your rivers clean, national parks and this. But what about kind of broader international sustainability things like global warming? consumption of fossil fuels, I mean there, you take a country like the United States, which is the perfect example of stability, but it's probably, you couldn't find a worse example as far as CO2 emissions and things like this, as far as global sustainability. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? Because sort of political sustainability ends up causing, or political stability ends up causing economic stability, which causes economic development, which is good but it also results in kind of large-scale natural resource consumption. Yeah, I mean, there are two, I see two things in your question, right? One is the global versus national. The other is, is stability good for the environment? Um, certainly, I would say stability is necessary, but not sufficient. And I'm a big critic of necessary and sufficiency <laughs> approaches for, for uh, describing the world. But uh, if you can um, bear with me, um, yeah, I, I don't think we would want to promote instability as a mechanism to, I don't know, you're oh, not suggesting no, that, but you know, yeah, to sort of flip it on its head, right? Um, <clears throat> so, what does one do with stability? What does one do with capacity for governance? Orange County has very high capacity for governance, right? And what do they use it for? Well, actually, Orange County has more protected areas than any other county in California. But aside from protected areas, they use it for, you know, strip malls. That's what they apply their capacity to, right? So it's certainly not enough, but it's a prerequisite. And then in terms of national versus global, most of these global things ultimately rely on national implementation. Certainly that's the case for, for global warming. Um, it's also the case for biodiversity. You know, ozone depletion, eh, it was a few companies, turn this big, no more CFCs, cool, problem solved. Most of this stuff requires national policy, and so ultimately, as in the case of Guatemala not implementing uh, forest-based climate change mitigation, you need institutions that last in order to implement these global goals. Um, in your opinion, what's been the best example of transformative um, environmental policy or transformation that's occurred in a pretty ins unstable country? Has there been any? Well, I like Bolivia. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking about what's going on in Bolivia. Um, because this is a case where in an extremely unstable, you know, there should not be successful environmental outcomes in Bolivia. And I would say Bolivia has not done much on a number of fronts, but regarding conservation, they are a global conservation leader. Um, and it's been a function of environmental constituencies being very savvy about how to deal with different crises and turn those into opportunities for change. Let me give you a concrete example. Um, Noel Kempf Mercado National Park in eastern Bolivia huge tropical protected area, more birds species than all of Canada, right? This area was protected after Noel Kempf, a very prominent environmentalist in Bolivia, was actually assassinated by Brazilian drug runners in the mid-1980s. Eastern Bolivia is just up in arms. They're marching in the streets because they're accusing the government of complicity with the, with the drug trade. And Bolivian environmentalists use this opportunity to go to the government and say, well, we've got plans for expanding this paltry little park that, you know, um, that uh, Don Noel was working on his entire life, you know, and we also, you know, we have the Nature Conservancy on the other line that would be really happy to work with us and, you know, donate some millions of dollars in scientific capacity. So they use that as a way to open up an opportunity to, to achieve conservation. In recent years in Bolivia, it's gotten trickier. I think with um, the Evo Morales, uh, administration, two things. Number one, the Bolivian environmentalists did not do a good enough job of creating constituencies across all indigenous organizations. So Morales really has completely alienated the folks who did all this work 
in Bolivia. Now, he has a rhetoric of sustainability that's a very interesting one. It pairs indigenous rights, socialism, and environmental protection. The reason why I find it interesting is sustainable development is all about people. And you protect the environment insofar as it is a mechanism for long-term well-being of people. And that's great, that's cool, I like people, right? But there are certain problems with that, namely, We've only named 1% of the world's species, so probably not all of them are necessary for, you know, condition for human betterment. People can be okay while trashing quite a bit of nature. So the sustainable development discourse is problematic in some sense. And Morales has, through an indigenous discourse, said, um, no, it's not all just about people, that actually nature is there right along with people, which has a lot more credibility than it does coming from some foreigner, you know, from the Nature Conservancy or whatever, where it sounds like a kind of misanthropic argument. So that's kind of a roundabout way. Yeah. Olivia, that's, that's the short answer.